Now I'm reading from Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to speak today on the power of prayer. I spoke on the power of the blood. Then I spoke on the power of the word of God. And today I want to speak on the power of prayer. And Matthew chapter 7 verses 7 through 11. And it's page 1003 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. Ask it shall be given, you seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven Give good things to them that ask him. Now in the book of James chapter 4 and verse 2. The Bible tells you there that you have not because you ask not. Now you can understand that. You have not because you ask not. Now the singing, the music, and the message will be on tape. And it's tape number 346. If you'd like to have this tape, you'd write it and get it for a gift of $3.00. This entire program will be on cassette tape. We have some 350 tapes that's available. I have a list of some uh, 340 tapes listed here. If anybody would like to have a list of our tape, we'd be glad to provide that. But if you'd like to have the tape we have today, number 346, you can write in and say, Preach every send me tape number 346, or send me the tape on the message of power of prayer. Now this is something that each one of us can do. Every true born again believer can pray. You might not be able to sing or preach or teach or do other things you'd like to do or play an instrument. But you can pray. And great things have happened because of prayer. I mean maybe just a few praying. And you've talked to God and God has done things. And we know great things happen through prayer. That's something we need to do. And I'm afraid that's one of our greatest sins and mistakes today. Is we don't pray as we should. Now prayer has power to bring a true knowledge of ourselves and our needs. Now when you begin to pray you can get a true knowledge of yourself and of your needs. The Bible says in Romans chapter 7 and verse 18. For I know that in me that is in my flesh... Dwaiteth no good things, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. So the apostle Paul realized he had nothing good within himself, but through prayer and through the work of the Spirit of God, you can get things accomplished. When Isaiah prayed in Isaiah chapter 6, he said, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And he began to talk to God, and then God sent him on a great mission. When he realized his condition and realized the power of God. Moses in Egypt standing at the burning bush at Midian. They saw the bush burning but not consumed. And God said, Moses, I have a mission for you. I want you to go back into the land of Egypt and lead my people out. And Moses said, I, I can't do it. I'm, I'm slow of speech. I'm not a good speaker. And I don't have the power and so forth. God said, you have a rod there in your hand, don't you? Yes, sir. And God performed a miracle. And God said, now you can go and lead my people out. And through the power God gave, Moses did that. The man Job that went through all the testing, trials, and troubles he had. We find in Job chapter 42 and verse 6, he thawed himself. And realized he had a little Phariseeism and a little pride. And he confessed that. And God gave him power after he prayed for his friends. And God gave him back more than he ever had before. you find that in the last chapter of the book of Job. Great things happen through prayer. Number two, prayer has power to cleanse our hearts from sin. In Psalms 119, or rather 19, verses 12 uh, and 13. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from faults. Keep back my servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. So when you pray and look to God and ask God to cleanse you from your secret sins or errors or presumptuous sins, God can do that and God will do that. In Psalms chapter 51 and verse 2, 
David praying after he committed the terrible sins he committed. Wash me through it from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And God did exactly that. God can do that. God will hear and answer and cleanse us from our sins. In John chapter 1 and verse 9, He said, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Every true born again believer ought to take that verse of Scripture, go before God, search out your heart, confess your sins to God, ask God to forgive you, and God promised to do so. Yes, we need to do more of that today. And then number three, we find prayer has power to hold us up in our going and give us victory over temptations. In Psalms chapter 17 and verse 5, uh, David said, Hold up my goings in thy paths, that my footsteps slip not. Now if we'll pray and ask God to direct our footsteps, God will do that. The steps of a good man is ordered by the Lord. And God is able to direct every step we take, every decision we make. God is able to take care of and direct us. In Luke chapter uh, 24 uh, and verse 40, And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that you enter not into temptation. And there Jesus, talking to his disciples, Jesus said to him, said, I want you to pray that you enter not into temptation. Now Jesus was facing the cross, but he said to his disciples, I want you to pray that you enter not into temptation. And then Jesus went out and began to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then the disciples prayed. No, they went to sleep. And because of that, they got into trouble. Jesus said, pray that you enter not into temptation. And Jesus wanted them to pray for him while he was out praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was facing the terrible death on the cross, but they went to sleep. Now, if we'll do some praying instead of so much sleeping, we'll most certainly be able to uh, control ourselves and, and God deliver us from temptations. And if you'd pray every morning before you leave home, then God could guide you through the day. But if you don't do that, you may have temptations during the day and things happen that you'll have to come in and confess up about that night. Had you prayed that morning, it might not have happened. Number four, prayer has power to govern our tongues. Now the Bible said no man can tame that little tongue of ours, but God has power to do that. In James chapter 3 and verse 8, But the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. No doubt in your life you've said to yourself, and may ask God to help you, but maybe you didn't have faith enough or pray enough about it. You said, I'm going to control my tongue. I'm going to be careful what I say around believers or unbelievers. If you're not careful, if you get around a group of people and they begin to criticize someone, you're prone to join in and get in your two cents worth. If you learn to keep your mouth shut, control your tongue, you'll be far better off. The Bible said God hates a lying tongue. God hates pride. God hates our sowing of discord. You may say, preachers, what do you mean by sowing of discord? Well, you know what a discord is. You musicians very well can understand discord. For instance, as two people that are friends and they love each other and they're having no problems. And then you go to one of them, you say, you know, I heard somebody say something about you. I heard them criticize you or speak about you from a negative viewpoint. And, and I'm just going to tell you about it. And I heard them say that and I'm going to pass it on to you. I want you to know it. Now, what have you done? You have sinned against God. You have sowed discord. You've tried to cause problems between those two friends. And that's a terrible sin inside of God. And whatever evil it comes out of it, God will hold you responsible. Don't sow discord among brothering or, or any of your friends. And you may say, well, I, I heard this. I was talking on the phone. I heard somebody say this or... Somebody uh, said this to someone else, and I'm going to tell them what they said. Isn't that terrible little tattletale? Well, that's awful. That's a sin against God. That should not be done. That's a sin you'll have to answer to God for sowing of discord. 
And every one of us can mighty easily do that if we're not careful. That's why we have to dedicate our tongues to God and say, God, we want you to control our tongues because you have the power to do so. I can stand here for a solid hour and tell you about the sins of that little three-inch member of your body that can run a six-foot man in the matter of a few minutes. I run a beautiful woman in the matter of minutes. And you'll answer to God for every evil you speak against anyone else. All the lies you tell, all the discord you sow, all the tales you carry from one to another. You'll answer to God for it in the day of judgment and give an account to God for all the damage that is done. So God's able to take care of this little member. In James chapter 3 and 8, verse 8, But the tongue can no man tame. It's unruly evil full of deadly poison. So you need God's help. And if you're not willing to ask God to help you control your tongue, you're in bad shape. You need to get lined up. In Psalms chapter 141 and verse 3, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. That's a good prayer to pray. God, keep the door of my lips. In other words, keep your mouth shut. Rather than say something negative or uh, some gossip you want to pass on, if you can't say something good or help a situation, then keep the door shut. Keep your mouth shut because you'll give an account unto God for it. Then we we'll move to thought number five, and that is prayer has power to bring us wisdom. There's not a one of us what doesn't need wisdom. I need it and you need it. I don't know it all, neither do you. The Bible says in James chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, If any of you like wisdom, let him ask of God, that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. If any man like wisdom, let him ask of God. You need to pray for wisdom every day. I need to do it. We don't have all the answers. We don't know it all. There's a lot of things we don't know. Let's pray for wisdom. The Bible tells us to do so. We need to do that. And God gives wisdom. In Psalms chapter 86 and verse 11, Teach me thy way, O Lord, and I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. So ask God to help you to live for him. Give, him, give you wisdom. Give you knowledge that you might live for him day by day. You ought to pray that prayer every day. Go in and shut the door. Shut the closet door. Get in there and talk to God. There are some things you need to talk to God about you don't have any business talking to anybody else about. Get in the closet. Tell God about it. And what do you talk to God about? It's nobody else's business. And we need to realize that God gives wisdom. Number six, we find that prayer has power to bring the Holy Spirit into our lives. There's not a one of us what doesn't need a mighty empowerment of the Spirit of God, a mighty, complete controlling of the Spirit of God. The Bible says be filled with the Spirit. That means be completely controlled by the Spirit. Now, it's, uh, getting the filling, the filling of the Spirit is not like pouring the water in a container. Uh, being full of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Ghost uh, by the believer, is a complete control of your life by the Spirit of God. In Luke chapter 11, verse 13, If you then been evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Now he's talking there about a complete controlling. If you are born again, believe you have the indwelling Spirit. Without the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. But you need to pray daily and constantly that God will control your life by the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 4 and verse 31, the Bible said, When they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and the, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now this was after Pentecost, some period of time after Pentecost. They got together and they began to pray and search out their hearts and talk to God. And the Holy Spirit came and literally shook that place. It shook that place. They began to speak the Word of God in boldness. And we need the Spirit of God to do that. Yonder in Greenville, South Carolina, many years ago, when God saved me, I joined the Westview Baptist Church and uh, became acquainted, of course, those people. There was assistant pastor for a while and, uh, and met those people and loved them. There's a lady there that's very timid. She wouldn't speak unless you spoke to her. She's very shy. And then after I left there and went back on a visit and 
And I, I, the pastor said she's one of the greatest soul winners that he had. Said she knocked on doors. She spent time in prayer. She asked questions about the Bible. I said, uh, preacher, what in the world happened to that woman? She was so shy and so timid. She'd blush when you spoke to her. He said, preacher, let me tell you something. Said she desired for a full control of the Holy Spirit in her life. And she prayed that God would fill her with the Holy Spirit. And said, God filled that woman, took over her life and controlling her life. And said, she's the greatest power in our church as far as an individual is concerned in winning souls and getting her prayers answered and learning the scriptures all because she's filled with the spirit of God. Now you may say, I'm shy. I'm timid. I can't get the job done. I, well, the Holy Ghost is the one to help you get the job done. He can get the job done through you, and it's his business to do so. Old David Brainerd, the man, that missionary, that spent years among the American Indians, that really burnt out for God. They say that man would go out in the snow to minister to those Indians, and it'd be so cold until before he came to the village, he'd kneel down in the snow, almost knee deep, and and with his uh, overcoat on, and he began to pray with such fervency and in such agony until he began to sweat and the snow would start melting around him as he talked to God. That man really laid hold on God. He knew how to do it. Old Charles G. Finney, that great evangelist, the Bible said that almost every individual without fail that he ever witnessed to he warned them to Jesus Christ. If it didn't come to God then, they came to God later as a result of that man of God witnessing them. Why? Because he was full of the power of the Spirit of God. He was a lawyer before God saved him. And he had gone in and out of some of the dead churches of that day. And he knew God wanted to preach. He said, I'm sick. I'm tired of dead churches. And I want the power of God upon me. And God gave him power. And he won literally thousands and thousands of people to God. He walked through a, a factory one day and they saw him walking down the aisle of that factory. And uh, the Holy Spirit of God just began to fall upon those people. And they became disturbed and the superintendent said, shut this place down. Let's get over here in another room and let this evangelist uh, tell us about Jesus. And he told them about Jesus and won many of them to God. That man, as he passed through a village, as somebody standing on the street saw him, they'd get under conviction. That man was completely controlled by the power of God. But uh, Charles G. Finney said he would be ashamed. He'd be ashamed for the sun to rise in the morning if he hadn't done spent at least two hours in prayer before sunup. A lot of times when he'd come in from his ministry, unsaddle his horse, he wouldn't go to bed. He'd take his saddle blanket, go up in the barn loft up there in the hay, get down on his knees, cover himself with that saddle blanket, and begin to talk to God and pray all night and literally soak that saddle blanket in, in perspiration. Man laid hold on God, great mighty man of prayer. Y'all in New York many years ago, there's a dear lady got under a burden for a revival. And she called another lady and she said, I want you to meet me at a certain place and we're going to pray God give us a revival. Let's meet at 10 in the morning. And she went to this place and, and then this other lady came and they prayed and they called other ladies. The next morning at 10 they came and they prayed and every morning at 10 o'clock the ladies would meet and pray until finally they filled the room full of ladies praying and God began to move on the scene and a revival broke out. As a result of those ladies praying, thousands of people came to God. Now we don't get the job done without prayer. We don't live the kind of life we should live without prayer. We don't witness like we should without prayer. We gotta have it. The power of God's Spirit, we can go in the attitude of prayer. Oh, John Knox, that great man of God of Scotland, had great power upon him and lived on his knees and cried to God every day for power. And sometimes praying six hours, twelve hours a day. And the Queen of England made this statement. 
The Queen of England said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than I fear the entire army of Scotland. She is afraid of the prayers of that righteous man of God. He lived on his knees. Now I'll tell you people, prayer will make the devil tremble. And there's not a one of us but what can't pray. You might not be able to sing or preach or play an instrument, as I said earlier. You might not have the talent or ability you like to have, but you can pray. You can go in the attitude of prayer and you can talk to God. Now prayer has power to do, to bring wonderful things out of the Word of God. Some of you like to know more about God's Word. I've been studying this book here for about 47 years. There's a lot of things in this book I don't really understand, but I'm still digging into it. And if I studied this book until I died, I still wouldn't have all the answers. This is the will of God you never draw dry. You keep drawing and more and more out of the will of God will come first water for you. And you need to dig into it. Memorize it. Study it. Compare scripture with scripture. Find out what God has in this book. It's a great mirror. It'll empower you. It'll help you. It'll give you great power. In Psalms 119 verse 18. Open thou mine eyes. I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Pray that prayer. Psalms 119 verse 18. Open thou mine eyes. Thou may behold wonderful things or wondrous things out of thy law. When you open the blessed book of God, you need to pray, God, help me today to understand things out of your word. Help me to see the deep spiritual things, the word of God, the esoteric things, there is man I know nothing about. God, help me to take a deep look in the wonderful word. You know, the apostle Paul was a man of prayer. Paul requested prayer for himself. Nothing wrong in you asking people to pray for you ought to. You ought to pray for your pastor. You ought to pray for your church every day. Pray for your Christian friends. Pray for your family. Pray for your lost children. Pray for your companion. Pray for your mother and daddy. You ought to have a list of people that you pray for every day that God lets you live. If you don't do it, you're missing out on something. You need to do that. There's an old deacon one time that's trying to have revival in the little old country church. He, he knew God wasn't there. He slipped down behind old terse and began to pray. The advanced pastor went by after service that night, heard the old deacon praying. The next morning when they went back to the morning service, he is still praying. You know what he was praying? He said, oh God, we're trying to have revival up here at the little church and you're not there. Won't you come and be with us? We want you there, Lord. Won't you come? When they came back after service, he's still praying, God, we're trying to have a revival at the little church and you're not there. That night he was still praying the same prayer. And finally God moved in. As an answer to that prayer, a revival broke out. The church was revived and many people come to know the dear Lord. Dr. Harold B. Seitler, one of the greatest Baptist preachers in America, pastor of the great uh, Tabernacle Baptist Church in Greenville. At one time he was pastor of a little church in Pelham. They went week in, week out, Monday, month in, month out, year in and year out, and never baptized anybody, never won anybody to God, uh, got them into their church. He got burdened about it. He said to his people, he said, you ladies meet and pray in this church. Men, these men go out in the cow pasture. They went out in the cow pasture and kept meeting in the cow pasture and kept, the women kept praying in the church and God moved in. Souls began to get saved. Result of it was that great Tabernacle Baptist Church in Greenville today where they're doing wonders for God, supporting over 500 missionaries, doing great things for God as a result of a few people talking to God. God can do it. The greatest prayer warrior I've ever read about was none other than pray and hide. Pray and Hyde was a son of a minister. And God laid on his heart to go to India to the mission field. That man went to the mission field in India and almost lived on his knees. Many times when other missionaries would go out to eat, he'd be on his knees. When they'd come back, he'd be praying. When they'd go back, he'd still be praying. Many times he'd get on a train to go from one town to another for a mission conference. Start talking to some sinner about God. And then he wouldn't get off where he's supposed to get off. He'd ride on maybe many, many miles to another town. He wouldn't give that man up. It went him to God. Then he'd catch another train back to the conference. He did that many times. Sometimes he was late. Sometimes he'd miss the conference because he got started talking to somebody about Jesus and couldn't let him go. That man would pray day and night to call him pray and hide. One time he took seriously ill and went to the doctor. 
And the doctor said to Hyde, said, you prayed with such intensity until your heart is beginning to move from toward your left side to your right. He said, you're living in agony and prayer. You're dying. You're not going to live much longer. And finally, he said to pray and hide, you, you just can't take it anymore. And pray and hide saw he wasn't going to live much longer. And he wanted to come back to America that he might die in America. Uh, in his own hometown. And, and so he started back to America and came to Wales in England. And uh, Chapman was over there, a great preacher, doing a meeting. And Chapman was trying to have a revival and nothing happening. And they heard about Pray and Hyde going back from India back to America. There to, to die, to spend his final days in America. They knew he had the power of God on him. They knew what he had done in India. They knew he had prayed down revivals and prayed those poor lost Indians into the family of God. They knew that. And so they sent for praying Hyde. And Chapman said, Hyde came in and he went to the prayer room and said, when that man walked in, you could feel the presence of God. Said they went in the prayer room. They all got on their knees. Nobody said anything, but you could just feel the presence of God. Then about five minutes, praying hard, said, Oh, God. And when he said that, people broke into tears. And he said, Oh, God, we want your power. And he said, You know, we felt like Jesus was right there in that room, that we could just reach out and touch him. said, We never felt such power in all of our life that that man had with God when he prayed. God came in great power. They wept and wept in that prayer room and wet the floor with their tears. Went back out in the audience. Chapman got up to preach and people feel that altar. Got right with God. The church revived. Great things took place. All because praying hide that dying man that had burnt out on his knees. And they called him praying hide because he prayed so much and so long and so often. And because of that man that had the power of God on him, that revival broke out. He came back to his home. Didn't live much long. Didn't live long after that. And finally went home to be with God. Now God is no respect of person. There's not a one of us in this building or out in the radio listening audience, but what couldn't be a prayer warrior. I've known people that were real prayer warriors. I've known women that could pray down the power of God. My old mother, God bless the sweet memories. I've seen her shout the victory, praise God, and I've trembled in her presence as she prayed and talked to God. I've known others that could get a hold of God, and you have too. And you mothers, you young ladies, you men, you boys, you can pray. You can be a person of prayer, and as you become a person of prayer, you'll be surprised to see what God Almighty can do in you and through you as you sojourn for God. And that's something, that's a ministry that every one of us can participate in, become a part of. That's a ministry of prayer. It'll change your attitude towards things. It'll change your life. It'll make you holy. It'll make you right. It'll make you do the right thing. And we sin again.